Well, before we look at a very famous psalm, Psalm 91 tonight, please join me in prayer. Uh, Father, once again, we come to you in prayer. Uh, Our little group of believers here is grateful to you for your word, grateful for the saving grace of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and grateful for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, who we beseech you to help us to have the wisdom to understand your word and the discipline to put it into practice that you would change us as we study your word, that you would convict us, and that you would help us to grow in the knowledge of your will and help us to seek your will above our own as we desire to be more like Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Psalm 91. This is a great psalm. This is one of the psalms that are probably one of the more popular psalms out of the whole book of Psalms. And this is going to be a psalm that's describing God's sovereign protection and if there's one thing i want you guys to take away from this psalm is this truth that believers have nothing that can harm them unless god permits it that's if you've learned nothing else from psalm 91 you take that principle away that nothing can harm someone who is putting their faith and trust in the lord unless it's something the Lord himself allows, which automatically puts it into a different context anyway. Yeah. Because he's then disciplining us, disciplining us or refining us or using even those things for our good, which is what I mean by it puts it into another category anyway. So that's an important thing to, to, to note here. Some people believe that the setting of the psalm is one of a, a people about to go into battle. Um, There's not a lot of specific references here, Um, so it's really meant to kind of be open, right? And the the idea that God is faithful to those uh, who put their trust and faith in him, and that in all ways is what I mean by it's open. There's not a lot of specific examples given that are pinpointed examples. Instead, it's more of a general idea that the Lord will protect those who are his, And he is sovereign and he is all-powerful. So if anything does ever happen to you, you can know that it was the Lord who allowed it. And so then, instead of complaining, you have a different reaction to when difficult things happen when you realize that, wait a minute, the only reason this difficult thing is happening is because God allowed it to happen. Mm -hmm. Whoa, wait a minute. (laughs) So it totally totally changes the game. Uh, With that in mind, the subtitle is My Refuge and my fortress, referring to who? God, God, yeah. The psalmist is saying God is his refuge and his fortress. And we'll read this one all the way through because it's only 16 verses. Uh, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Isn't that great? And especially when, when you take it in the context of what I said, the, the one thing you take away from this is that God takes care of his own and nothing happens to you unless the Lord allows it. 
I just, that, again, pound that into your brains <laughs> because that is what the, the major meaning of Psalm 91 is. But there's other stuff we can learn from Psalm 91, like question one. What do verses one through two mean, and what truth do they convey, or truths? Uh, verses one and two say this, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. What about just verse one on its own? What, what is that telling us? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. What is this, what is this telling us? Sure. So if I say, um, if you say, I'm, I'm really worried about this or that, and I say, you should shelter in the most high. What am I telling you? What's another way of phrasing that? Trusting God. Trusting God. Go to God. Shelter, right? Run to him for shelter. Trust in him. Dwell in the shelter of the most high. So go to him. Seek him out. Seek him out. And abide or live or spend your time in the shadow of the Almighty. If, if I'm in somebody's shadow, that means a couple different things, right? I'm in somebody's shadow. Number one, I have to be C-L-O-S-E, close. I must be close in order to be in somebody's shadow. And this isn't just anybody we're talking about. This is the Almighty. The other thing is, 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 is Israel a place, uh, would you say that the people of Israel were more likely to be in places that were desert-like, warm, high sun, very hot. So if you're in a land like that, what's something that would come in handy? Shade. Yeah, shade or a shadow. Yep, same idea there. So the, it, both, both of those ideas are meant to convey God's protection, God's provision, his care. And that's the idea of being close to God or another way of phrasing it is being in the presence of God. Looking over. Mm-hmm. He's looking over you. Yeah, absolutely. Now, yeah, now he's aware, you know, he's aware and you go to him when you need those things. What about verse two? I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God and whom I trust. What, what is that really telling us? So well, this is, God. yeah, he says, right? Calls God his refuge, calls God his fortress. Again, a, yeah. Again, an idea or a, a, an idea of a, symbolically a place you run to for shelter, protection. Right. You don't go to a fortress for, you know, Yahtzee. You don't. You, run, you go ice cream. <laughs> I like ice cream and Yahtzee, but that's not the reason you go there, right? You go to a stronghold when you need protection. So God is meant to be seen in similar terms as a fortress or a stronghold. So when you're in danger, you run to a fortress or a stronghold who is the Lord. And the, the psalmist even says, he's my refuge. So he's my shelter. He's my fortress. Just so you understand, it's not just shelter from the sun. It's a fortress. It's a shelter in battle or in hardships or tribulations. And it's in him, the psalmist refers to God and says, it's in him I trust. So his trust isn't in anything else. It's not in horoscopes or in money or in, you know, I got a lot of family members who've got my back if somebody, something goes wrong. Like, nope, the trust he expresses is in the Lord. And that's the whole idea of Psalm 91, that, that the centering of Psalm 91 is, is your trust is in God, that you can have absolute trust in him. And already we see that really well portrayed just in the first two verses. What about question two, which says, read verse three, okay. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. What is the snare of the fowler? It's a trap, it's a trap for what kind of Birds. animal? A bird, yeah, it's a bird trap. A bird, yeah, yeah. it's a snare of the fowler. Birds have to come down to the ground, right? When they come down to eat or to drink, they are vulnerable. So the idea here is that God will protect you and he will deliver you. And an example is given from the snare of the fowler and from deadly pestilence. So from clever hunters or from uh, devious traps or plots, 
you can trust God in those ways too. This is all this is, is just general examples of how and why you can trust God. And in what situations can you trust God in? The answer is all situations. And so this is what the psalmist is attempting to do, to give you just a few examples of situations that you can trust the Lord in. So anything that was set up meant to be a trap to endanger your life, God's got it, right? You can trust God in those situations and he'll deliver you from traps, from things intended to endanger or snare your life. And then deadly pestilence. What's, uh, what's that meant to mean? Disease, yep. Plagues, disease. Um, could even have, because this is, is linked very tightly to battle, it could also mean like a siege situation. Like if your town is under siege and people are getting sick and there's no food and there's no water and you can't clean your wounds and there starts to be all these plagues and pestilences and stuff, you can still trust in the Lord. Same idea. This is not meant to be an overarching claim. So in other words, what I mean by that is um, this is not this is not a blank check for every single believer. So from the time that this was written to our current time now, what I mean is, is that this is not something you can say, walk through town in the middle of the bubonic plague and rub bubonic plague on your face and say, it's no effect because God said he will protect me from pestilence. Right? That's not the idea that this is portraying. The context here is not an idea of God will protect you from all pestilences, so therefore you're immune to it. Don't worry about it. That's not the idea. The idea is, is that, again, the same drumbeat at the very beginning. Right? God will protect you, and the, on the only way you can have harm come to you is if God allows it. So does God allow Christians to be affected by plagues? Yeah, yeah. And is that something God can use for his glory and our good? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. So you've got to be careful of this because there's a lot of different uh, factions that like to call themselves Christians that will take verses like this out of context and tell you, look, right here in the Bible it says, you don't have to fear any kind of pestilence. I mean, there was plenty of, uh, of charismatic teaching going on during COVID using that verse. Huha bakanda shakamakaluguha. God says in his word that you don't have to fear pestilence. Look at it says it right here in Psalm 91, right? And then you pull that one verse three out and read that. And most people would be like, oh wow, it is in the Bible. Oh, it's gotta be true, right? Don't worry about the context. Don't worry if that's really what it's saying. You see why we have to be careful with that? That's one of the other reasons why I really wanted to beat the drum of, of God. nothing can come to nothing can harm you unless the Lord allows it. And he can use warfare, he can use pestilence, he can use sickness, he can use um, difficulties and hardships, physical ailments, whatever. He can use anything he wants or allow anything he wants to happen into somebody's life. The fact of the matter is, though, is that God is so good and God is so faithful and so, God is so wonderful that if he's allowing that to happen in a believer's life, it's for a good reason. It could be for chastisement or correction. It could be for refining. It could be to drive that person to their knees to ultimately get them to depend even more on the Lord. It could be to rip something away that somebody is holding up as an idol, as higher and more important to the Lord than, than himself. Could be for any of those reasons, right? And we have to trust in the Lord. And that's the whole idea here is that you can trust in the Lord. That in any of these situations, and it's just examples to, to really drive home the point that God protects those, he, uh, those that are his. What about question three? What does verse four mean? What are pinions and what is a buckler? Verse four says, he will cover you with his pinions. Who's the he referring to there? God. God will cover you with his pinions. And under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. Does God have wings? No. No. This is just, just using illustration, right? It's just an illustration. God does not have wings, uh, per se. So when you see that, and it says he will cover you with his pinions, what are pinions? Some, some, some uh, translations will have different word than pinions, but they all mean the same thing. Anybody know? It's referring to a part of the wing 
And it's the part of the wing that has like um, the part that's used for flight. So it's got all those different uh, metacarpuses and, and carpuses in there. And so that's the part it's talking about. He'll think of the whole wing. He'll hide you under the whole wing. Not just, not just the edge of the feathers, but you're underneath the whole thing. The whole connective part, you're there underneath the wing. The, the big part or the big part of the wing that, that allows the bird to fly. So he's going to cover you under his wing. And under his wings, you will find what? Refuge. Refuge. Protection. Protection. Safety. Not only that, God's faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. Any idea what a buckler is? Everybody knows what a shield is, right? Shield is generally a bigger shield that you would hold in your hand or wear on your arm, and it's generally of, of greater size, right? Some are, some are like two pizza, pizzas round, you know. Other ones would be full length of your body, like a Roman shield. But a buckler is, a, is, is like a shield, except it's a different kind of shield. It would be something very small that you would hold in your hand or have on your wrist. A very small style shield. Usually worn on... Uh, on your forearm or you'd hold it by the straps so it's just a small shield so he's like a, a shield or a buckler and what does a shield do protects what does what is refuge protection so what's this telling you about god that god himself is going to cover you it says god himself don't miss that god does not send a secondary representative right he's not he's not disinvolved He's not some heavenly father who delegates to uh, a heavenly nanny to take care of you, right? And he doesn't really care what happens to you, you know, update him every once in a while. No, this is, this is a caring God who's aware of every situation, and he himself will cover you with his pinions under his wings, and there you will find refuge, protection, shelter. And his faithfulness, and this is an attribute of God, it's his faithfulness that is a shield and a buckler to us. Why would that be encouraging to us, that, that God's faithfulness is a shield to us? Why is that encouraging? Does his faithfulness ever fail? No. Does our faithfulness fail? Yes. But God's doesn't, right? This is why, so God's ability to be a shield for those who run to him for refuge or in other words who trust in him is perfect because his faithfulness is perfect so then in other words that's how i know look if something's happening to me it's because god has allowed it it's not because he's distant it's not because he has forgotten me it's not because he doesn't lack or because he lacks the power he has a purpose in allowing this to happen to me if something is happening to me and that's also comforting because then even when I'm being hurt, it's someone who loves me more than I love them even that's allowing it. So I can even trust that. That's, that'll keep you up at night counting sheep, thinking about that. And then it also, you know, it gives God the ability to correct us. And like we saw last time, God corrects those he loves, which is something that we don't like, right, in the moment. In the moment, we don't like being corrected. But just like as you grow older, you realize that your parents corrected you. If they were doing it right, they did it for the right reasons and with the right motives. And they were ultimately trying to protect you and help you. And if parents, earthly parents who are imperfect, have that desire, how much more so does our perfect Heavenly Father, whose faithfulness is perfect, have that desire? And that's the point to be made here. Question four, who is the you? Referring to in verses five and six, it says, you will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in, or stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Who are the you? Believers. Believers, yeah. Those who put their trust in the Lord. And those who are, put their trust in the Lord, what are they protected from according to those same verses? You will not fear the what? Terror, terror of the night. And that would be, uh, night is representative of darkness, right? You won't fear darkness. All you have to do is watch the news for a few minutes and you'll see plenty of darkness and you can see reason to fear the darkness 
right? But because of the Lord, you don't have to fear darkness or the terror that darkness brings, right? Because that can be quite debilitating. But you don't have to have that, dark, that fear of the darkness or the fear of the night or fear of being vulnerable to darkness if you are putting your trust in the Lord. What else are they protected from according to these verses? You will not fear the terror by night, nor the what? Yeah, what could that be talking about? Yeah, what, when does that, you, battles, yeah, war, battles. I was going to say, when do you usually have arrows being shot? Battles, war. We're talking about you, can that be too? Yeah, you can look at it from a, from a you know, a, a secondary contextual point. So there would be a, a strong, so in other words, like um, when you look in a dictionary and it has two definitions, it usually puts the most common definition first. And then ha- if there's a second definition, it'll be second underneath it. You can look at the context here in, in two ways. The first and most strongest context is battle and war. A secondary context that would be equally ap- applicable <laughs> would be your daily battles in yeah. life, like what you were mentioning. So Now it has another uh, in verse 6. What else are they protected from? Nor the what? Bugs. <laughs> or the word that's used there, the P word that's used there, pestilence. Bugs. Yes. Bugs, sickness and disease that bugs can bring. <laughs> or destruction. So general, generally speaking, right, this covers the whole span of everything. So you don't have to fear darkness. You don't have to fear war, battle, your daily struggles, any of that stuff. You don't have to fear pestilence, sickness, disease that comes with um, insects or anything else or the death that comes with those things you don't have to fear destruction or a wasting away or de- destruction even if it happens in the morning or in the noonday don't fear any of these things and this is wonderful because it would be very there is a temptation to be um fear ridden by everything that we just mentioned especially darkness i think i think you know darkness in general if i just say you look at the horizon of what's coming and what's already happening that could be pretty uh, spooky to look at that and say, boy, what, what happens if, if the world just turns upside down? And, you know, people hate the truth, right? You could say that, true or false, the world hates the truth. True. True. Right? Abortion is evil and it's murder, right? And, and people who hate the truth will rage at such a statement, right? Or uh, when you bring up sin, or you bring up anything like that, or God's wrath, or anything like that, right? The world hates that. And so it rages against that. And when you understand that that's what we're called to tell everybody of, <laughs> right? The, the church has got it all wrong. The modern-day evangelical church has it all wrong. It's all about God loves you. Oh, God loves you. And that's the wrong, that's the wrong thing it should be saying. The, the thing it should be saying is what everything in the Bible says, what all the apostles say, what Jesus himself says, right? Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Repent. God's wrath is upon you. Repent. Repent. Come to him in faith for the forgiveness of sins. That's the message. That's the message. Instead, the message that's being taught by the... And that, that's a message that the world can, can't... The world doesn't understand the whole repent because you've got to talk about the bad stuff then. But if you go to the world and you say, Jesus loves you, you can say, oh, <laughs> wonderful, because I love me too. And so and God loves me just the way I am. Oh, that's great. I can just keep on living the way, way I'm living and I don't have to worry about changing my life or repenting, right? So this is a message that the true church needs to hear because it's scary to go up and talk to people and tell them that they are in eternal danger, that they are sinners in the hands of an angry God and that they must, too, put their trust in the Lord and in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins before it's too late. And knowing that that's what we're called to do is a scary thing. And even if you do it for years, it's still intimidating. It's still scary because you don't know what, you know, how people are going to react. A lot of times you do kind of know how they're going to react, but it's a scary thing, but this softens it, doesn't it? I can trust the Lord in any situation, no matter what darkness is going to do. So what, right? God is sovereign, right? So if, 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 if darkness says, why I oughta, you know, I'm going to pull all your flowers out of your church garden and I'm going to, I'm going to spit on your windows. 
I'm going to do all those things, right? And God says, sure, I'll allow that, right? Do I sit there and bemoan and say, oh, God has forsaken us. Oh, God has left us. Well, no. I can be like, well, God's got something. He's, he's doing something. I don't know what he's particularly doing. Maybe it's an opportunity for us to show forgiveness. Maybe it's an opportunity, right? Or to say, you know, what you did there was wrong. But, heck, I've got a whole list of things I've done that was wrong that, thankfully, I won't have to stand in front of the judgment seat of God for because Christ has taken my place. And he will do the same thing for you. And you can do it that way. Maybe that's why God's doing it, you know? Or maybe those flowers were my idol. And I had them a little too high up on the scale of things, right? I mean, there's all kinds of different reasons. But it's important, I think, for us to, to have these assurances that, hey, if anything happens, nothing's going to happen to you. And if something does, it's only because God allowed it. Did I tell you about the car I had that I absolutely loved more than anything ever that I put in a ditch? Sorry, Mom. About. <laughs> she said she loved the car more than absolutely anything ever. I mean, oh, I mean that car, I loved that. I took it about two weeks after I got it, and I'm like, okay, that taught me not to love my cars anymore. Yeah, I mean, there's certain, we do. As you, as you mature in your spiritual walk with Christ, you do begin to look at things from that biblical perspective. You do begin to look at things like, okay, I can see how God used this situation to draw me closer to Christ. Or I can see how God used that situation to break this um, idolatrous part of my life or to make me come closer to him or to make me more dependent upon him and ultimately to make us uh, for our good and for his glory. And that does kind of tie in with the last point I want to make about question four. Who's the one protecting them and doing all this? God. God. Have you ever hesitated giving the gospel to oh, someone? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, except for me, most of the time it's not about, I don't fear the reaction. Um, if I ever have, have a hesitation, it's because of more selfish uh, reasons than that. Like, uh, what if it turns into a 20-minute thing and I've only got five, you know? Like, I find that to be even more shameful of a reason than, ooh, I'm scared about what they're going to say. You know, most people have, a, I'm scared of how they're going to react, I don't want to hurt their feelings, da 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 I can get over that pretty easily in my own mind. I get over that by being like imagining them burning in the lake of fire. It's like, okay, I can get over that stumbling block a little easier. For me, the one I have to watch out for is um, not per se laziness, but oh, what if it turns into like an hour-long conversation because I, I will think it through too far. And be like, well, if I say something to this person right here and right now, it might turn into something that's going to take too long. And then I'm going to be agitated, and I'm not going to do a good job. You know what I mean? And you're thinking of yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's why I said it's more selfish than the other. You know, the other one is selfish in the sense that I'm scared to do it. And so out of fear, personal fear, I, I don't do it. I find it more egregious to have the stumbling block that I have, which is any hesitation whatsoever because of, of you know, well, I don't know how long it's going to take. Yeah. What does that matter? You know, like tell me something that's more important. And it's like, but you have, that's my flesh. So you have to, my flesh is saying, well, you know, maybe it might take a little too long. You know, what if, it, what if this person turns out to be a talker? <laughs> you know, oh, that's the flesh, right? Yeah. That. Now that's the, that's the flesh, right? Days, so, then, so then my prayer is always like, God, don't let that get in the way. Like, let me overcome that. So that the, the, the spirit overrides that. So that, that's there and you validate that it's there, but it doesn't mean it's right. So then you overwhelm that. You pray that God will help you overcome that. So then you say, but it doesn't matter how long. That's actually a good thing. If somebody wants to sit and talk about Christ for a while, are you kidding me? Of course that's a good thing. So then you, that's how you overcome the flesh. You're like, well, wait a minute, right? But I think it's, it's good to talk about the honest roadblocks that we have in sharing the gospel so that they are a clear and present in your mind that you know that they need to be prayed about and that you're aware of them so that you can overcome them easier. Anything you talk about openly with other believers, it makes it easier to overcome it when you're the only believer around and it's just you and the Lord and there's nobody else. If, we, if any of us were, let's say you and I go to Dollar General and uh, we're together and somebody comes over and you know, you overhear, we overhear them talking about like, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I'm making it to heaven or not. The minute you hear that, right, as a, as a Christian you should be like, ding, right? Your ears should perk. 
right? And because you're with me, I would be far more likely to go over and interject myself, right? Because I have that support, support but I also, it's also a... You're also teaching. Also teaching, and I also would be ashamed even more if I didn't do it in front of another believer. Right? So all those are good motivators to overcome whatever the roadblock is to doing that. But now if you're not there with me and that same thing happens, how much harder is it, right? And so it helps to talk about it like this because then it's, you're at least there with them in spirit, <laughs> if, if not bodily. But it is nice to be able to be around you know, each other, to be able to stir up each other to be able to do that. And sometimes your failure in one situation is going to be used by God to convict you and train you and make you into the type of person who won't fail the next time. I mean, there's many times where, where I will leave a situation and I'll say, oh, I, should have, I should have said something. That and yep. We've all done that. Oh, yeah, everybody does. That. Oh, yeah. But that's the, that's the thing, you know, then, you, then as soon as you see that, then what do you do? You pray, you know, oh, God, forgive me, you know. And that happened to me not that long ago. There was an older gentleman in a restaurant that I was at, and he just looked sickly, right? So I'm kind of watching him as he's kind of looking sickly and getting up and paying his bill. And he, and I was trying, he was having this really long conversation at the, at the pay counter. So the whole time I'm thinking like, boy, should I just get up and follow him out? And like sit on the bench and wait for him. And when he comes out, like, like I think the God, Lord wants me to, to give you the gospel. Just because I'm thinking he looks like he could kick, kick over any second. Right? And I'm not saying that in, a, in, a, in an evil way or a mean way. Just looking at him thinking, you know, I wonder if he's got the gospel. And so what did I do? I thought about it too much. Right? And then he said something. I forget what it was that made me go, oh, maybe now's not the time. And I, I, you overthink it. And then he leaves. And I'm like, right? So I was like, dang it. I should have just done it. Should have just put my money on the tab and, you know, let him get the money at the, instead of going up the Because that's the only thing. Like, well, I'll do it. If I leave that, and eh, hooey. Should have just left money on the table to cover the bill, went out and sat on the bench, and as soon as he came out, right? So you have to be honest with yourself about that, but also hold yourself accountable to those things. And so so that you can grow and that you can do a better job the next time and not miss those opportunities like that. And then I think, you know, it's also inspiring teachable moment like Bob mentioned that somebody else who's a believer in the area, is, you know, anywhere around you sees that, that's an encouragement to them. And that's a strong motivator for me quite a bit. Because I'll say to myself quite a bit, well, if I don't do it, if I don't do it, if I don't lead the way, and do it in this situation, how can I expect those who I teach to do the same thing, right? So then that's a really strong motivator for me because it's like, well, I have to, I have to do it. I have to shut, set the example, you know? And sometimes you have that thought one or two or three minutes too late. Just like I did with that one, I'm like, dang it. And I was going back and forth. I was like, I don't know, I should have just did it, you know? So we all have those moments, but I'm prayerful that we can all grow from those. So we're done with question four. What about question five? What do verses seven and eight mean? Those verses say this, A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. So this is a, a definitely talking about like a battle scene here. Lots of People are, are what? Lots of people are what in, the, in these verses? They're uh, dying. dying, yeah. I'm glad you all knew my dying sound. Yeah. It was puking? Yeah. <laughs> that could have been a puking sound, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> your, your giant head. So, just move it back a little bit. There. So, this is telling us that the, the faithful person doesn't have to fear death or harm why doesn't a faithful person have to fear death or harm are you invulnerable indestructible no so why would the psalmist say in this sense that you don't have to fear death or harm because he's in control because god's in control yep so again god calls you home he calls you home 
If he calls you to be injured, you're injured. If he calls you, calls you to be safe through that whole thing, you're safe through that whole thing. But no matter what, you are safely in his hands, perfectly under his wings, totally in his refuge and his fortress and his strength. So how does that help us? Does it help? Let me, let me phrase it this way. Does it help to know that, that God will protect us, but that he may allow us to be hurt? Yeah. And if it does help us, how? How does it help us to know that? Because for me, if I'm hurt, I know that my family and my, my church family and uh, other people that I know will be praying. Mm -hmm. And if I die, I know where I'm going. Yeah. And that in it's any of those situations, yeah, it's assurance and, and insurance that, that God's going to take care of you. And that if something happens that God was a part of that. So in other words, God is part, God is responsible in part of the good, and God is responsible in part of the not so good, except God is so good that he uses the not so good for our good. <laughs> pretty pretty amazing. Was, that was good. Well, thank good. you. That's a t-shirt right there. Yeah. <laughs> Just go to Etsy next month and we'll have a bunch of church stickers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What did I say again? I'm gonna have to rewind the tape. Yeah, if you make a plaque, I'll put it on my front door, and people will go. What? Yeah, I'll be like, obviously that that's got to be a pastor quote right there. I'm saying, you know, but you know, only the believer understands that God can use difficulty and hardship as a blessing. Because think about it, if if I'm not a believer. And if somebody says that statement to me, I'll be like, what? That's just a total cop-out. Because now you're telling me that God will protect you from anything. But if anything does happen to you, don't worry because God was allowing that. That just sounds like a cop-out, right? That's what the unbelieving world would say. No, that's just a cop-out. I mean, you're covering all your bases. If the good things happen to you, you say God was good to you and he's great and faithful. And if bad things happen to you, you know, you can say, well, God allowed it because, you know, he's, he's using it for your good to ultimately train you via refining and difficulty to trust in him more. Eh, it sounds like a cop-out. That's how the unbelieving world would see that. But a believer who's been gone through all this and who the Lord has regenerated, you've already been through this in many ways, and you've already seen all the sinful things that you did in your past and how God used that to train you up to the point of salvation and all the all the newness of life and that you have that realization and now you're like wow god uses everything no pain is wasted no difficulty what were you saying well to me like the unbeliever would be would place blame on god mm -hmm. because they think they deserve better mm -hmm. yeah 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 what's that saying um the the wicked believe that they are good and those who are righteous in faith know they're not. And that's the truth. Like any, any of us, we know we're not good. We know that, that the only goodness in us comes from the Lord. That, that nothing good, there's nothing good in me except what the Lord has put there. So it's, he gets all the glory, he gets all the honor, he gets all the praise, not me. But yeah, the unbelieving world would be, well, I deserve good things. I deserve a pain-free life. I deserve all these different things. Well, Priest has said that when you share the gospel with her. What? Oh, you really believe that God did that? Yeah. You know, she always questions. Because I told mm -hmm. her, I, she said, back to the car. Somebody broadsided her, T-boned her in this Cadillac that she had gotten. Mm -hmm. and she loved I loved my vibe, and I put her in a ditch and towed it. Mm. I said, you love that car more than you love God. Oh, God didn't have anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. But she always said it. Sure, yeah. And that's a, you know, that's a, a misunderstanding of who God is, right? She, she knows better. She just doesn't want to give up her wicked ways. Well, part of that is the fact that, look, if I say that God is sovereign, I have to, I'm accepting a lot of truths there. There's people who are, who are uh, professing believers that have a hard time 
accepting that truth. Because if I say God is sovereign, that means he is ultimately in control of everything. As R.C. Sproul used to say, there's no maverick molecules. That, that God is in control of everything. Now, if I say that, there's a lot that comes with that. There's a lot that comes with that. That means that everything good and bad is of the Lord. And there are a lot of people who profess to be believers in God who have a hard time saying that God is the one who brings calamity, that God is the one who brings difficulty and hardship and stuff, be it directly or indirectly. They have a hard time giving God any of the credit for that, even though God himself says that he's the one who brings calamities, that he raises up kings and knocks them down, raises up nations, and raises them to the ground. Even though God says those things, right? And even though God's the one who's ultimately in charge of everything, they have a hard time doing that. But this forces you to, ex to acknowledge it. Well, it's like Scripture does. Today, there, there's a lady I was talking to today calling them a taste real quick. And uh, she said, I don't know if it was the grandson or her son was really sick and they thought he had this disease that was really bad. And they took him in for tests. And when they came back, they said it wasn't that, it was something else that wasn't so bad. And she went, oh, praise the Lord. And the pastor was standing there. He went, would you have said that if he would have came back with bad news? Yeah. And she went, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, praise the Lord for, the, for everything. Yeah. Literally, you can praise the Lord for everything. That's why, that's why Paul and Silas were singing songs of praise while they're in prison. Like, how? You're in prison. This is why. Because they understood that they were there because that's exactly where God wanted them to be. And so you can rejoice in that and be like, hey, God, we praise you. And what seems crazy to the world is actually quite normal for a believer because you see God as completely in control of everything. And so therefore, only nothing bad is going to befall you. But if something does, it's only because God has allowed it, just like Paul and Silas being in jail. And God used that, didn't he? So it's the same idea. And that's a great challenging statement. You know, would you praise God even if, you know, if you pray for this but God gives you that, will you praise him either way? Will you praise him for this or that? Or will you only praise him when he does what you want him to do? That's a submission to God's will. Good thought. All right, second part of question five it talks about verse eight. What's verse eight mean? You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Recompense of the wicked is God's judgment. So when it says you will only look with your eyes and see the judgment of the wicked, what is it really telling the person who's putting their trust in the Lord? He's not going to be involved. He's going to be a... You're a spectator, yeah. You're, a sp you're on the side. You're, you're not going to have to worry about God's recompense or his judgment. You, you'll be able to see it, but you're not going to be a part of it. And that's also very encouraging, isn't it? Question six. How should we interpret verses nine and ten? And is this a blanket statement for all believers? Uh, it says this in those two verses. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, and no plague come near your tent. How should we interpret that? Is that a blanket statement for all believers? Should I be able to go up on Sunday morning and preach to you guys and say, the Lord has told me in Psalm 91, your worries are over. No evil shall ever befall you and no plague will ever come near your tent. So make sure you move into tents. Because if you're in a house or a mobile home or an apartment, no promise there. <laughs> Only if you're living in I tents. Big tents <laughs> if I was in a church, and you were the pastor and God yeah. said that, yeah. I will walk out. Good. You know? Good. Because that's a bad church, right? You're not handling God's scripture rightly. And that is the most important thing to do. Like if you can't handle God's word rightly, then you're, you're not a pastor. You're not a teacher. It's not a church. Because that's the most important part. Because you've got to get that part right. Because if you're not handling God's word right, you've got everything else wrong. Because God's word is what directs us in every in everything. It's our authority in everything. So, so the, we know this is not a blanket statement just from the simple fact of what we've already been saying, right? Bad things, every one of us here has had evil befall us. Bad things happen to us. So 
and, and, and you might not have a tent where the plague has come near you, okay? But the idea here with plague isn't just an illness. It's also like a physical, um, physical attack. Not just, a, not just a, so a physical attack can mean an illness or a boom, 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 right? Either way. So the idea here is that no physical harm will come to you, right? So we know that this is not a blanket statement just because of what we've seen in other scripture, right? And we know that God doesn't contradict himself. If there's seemingly a contradiction with scripture, it's in context. It's always a context issue. Sometimes a translation issue, but mostly it's a context issue. So how should we interpret those verses then? If you make the Lord your dwelling place, in other words, if, if you go to him and that's where you put your trust and your faith in the Most High, if he's your refuge, well, then no evil shall be allowed to befall you and no plague come near your tent. How should we, how should we interpret that? You know it's not a blanket statement, so what, how do we... God's still in control. God's still in control. And that kind of links... It's close enough to what I want to say, which is this is really highlighting God's absolute nature. Yes. That, that, that's what it's really highlighting. This isn't a specific promise as much as it is an illustration of God's absolute protection. That's all. Again, not a specific promise, but highlighting God's absolute protection. Because you have to, when you're reading the Psalms, sometimes you have to ask yourself, is this literal? Or is this something that is symbolic? Is he literally saying that absolutely no plague will ever come, no evil will ever come towards a believer, ever? Uh, you got a, uh, a Holy Spirit off spray all around you, and like a mosquito, it won't come near you, right? Because you've, you've been sprayed with the Holy Spirit. And so now no evil will befall you. And if evil does befall you, well, it must be because you're a sinner or because you don't have enough faith or all these things, right? So it's not a blank statement. Now, now does, does God allow things to happen to his people as a way of correcting them? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So right away, you know that this bl that's not a blanket statement in that regard. And that's why, you know, th you just can't make, it's a bad idea to make blanket statements. Because they, very rarely are they true. Because I can make a, a scriptural argument for God allowing bad things to happen to somebody as a way to draw them back to themselves. Or back to God, no, to correct, to refine, to to do to chastise. God does that. He chastises those He loves. As a matter of fact, so so that is a thing. So it, really, what we want to pay attention to here is that God is absolutely in control of everything. So if you've made the Lord your dwelling place, if He's your refuge, if He's the Most High to you, then you can trust Him in every sense against evil. And you can trust him in any sense against any kind of physical harm or anything like that. That he's in control of all that. That's the better way to look at this. That he's in control of all those things. In other words, the same thing we said at the beginning, right? Nothing's going to happen to you unless he allows it. And that statement includes what we're reading in verse 10. No, all evil, that statement includes all plagues or physical harm. That God is in absolute control of all that, so... Nothing's going to happen to you unless he allows it. That's the statement that's being made here. It's just meant to, to really highlight God's absolute nature of protection, that it's so perfect that if, it do, if something does happen to you, it's because God has allowed it. And even if he's allowed it, he's allowed it for your good, your ultimate good. It might bring bad, but the bad will bring good. <laughs> you know what? I just. <laughs> 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 Wait, he's gonna be really busy. Up there. I know. I know. Yeah, <laughs> man. Yeah. He'll need a big one. Don't encourage me. Don't encourage me. Well, maybe we could put. We could do, we could do uh, you know, tongue-in-cheek ones for, for bad church teachings, too. Like, you know, you didn't have enough faith, God. You know, like, like yeah. Right when you say that, it's like, oh, yeah. But how many times have I heard that from a pulpit, you know? Oh, if you're still having that problem, it's, you know, I tell you what, uh, God's faith is perfect, so that means the problem's with you. 
you know, or something to that effect. Well, that's basically what they're saying. You didn't have enough faith. Signed, God. You know, too bad. <laughs> but that's just the point, you know. Like this is this is meant to this is meant to encourage believers, but it should also humble us. Like I'm encouraged that I know that God is in control of everything and that God is protecting me and He's watching over me. I am also humbled to know that God might allow things to happen to me that I would find disconcerting, painful, hard, hurting. But I can trust Him either way. Tell me when those bad things happen that you learn the most. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Because if you're happy, go lucky, and you know, everything seems to be going, if you're not learning anything no. in those times. It's those hardships mm-hmm. that make you change. Yeah, and I think that the more, the longer you've walked with the Lord, the more you're able to look back and note specific examples of what you just said. That, you know, when I grew the most in that battle. You know when I grew the most? When I was really sick and when all that bad stuff was happening. You know when I, when I grew the most is when I went through that painful divorce. You know when I grew the most is when I lost my business. You know, because I was on my hands and knees praying to the Lord. He ripped everything away from me and all I had was Him. You know, and so that's why, you know, believers can look at that as a blessing. Where hardship can even be a blessing. Wow. Now you're, now you're showing signs of maturity when you can even call hardships blessings. You're on the right track. At the moment, it might not feel that way. Exactly. But once you have learned it, mm-hmm. then it's there. And that's what Paul says, that, that, you know, that at, in the moment, no d- discipline seems comfortable or good, but it produces the fruit of righteousness is the whole idea. And that's what God is doing. He is training us. He is... A, you know, he doesn't just say, I have decided to save you. Welcome to the land of cake and honey and candy canes and unicorns, rainbows and staplers, yeah, staplers, donuts, you know. You'll never have another care in the world. Like scripture, nowhere does scripture say that, right? The only, the only place in scripture that it talks about some place where there's no more tears, sorrow, suffering, anything like that, is the promise of heaven. But before that, it's just the opposite. In this world, you will have trouble, tribulation. But Jesus says it doesn't stop there in John 16, 33. He says, but take heart or have courage. I have overcome the world. Yeah, same idea here. Same idea here. Question seven. What ideas or promises are verses 11 through 13 meant to convey? Uh, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Let's go verse by verse, and we'll ask the second part of the question after we're done with that. Uh, verse 11, what's that meant to convey? That he will, for he will, God will, command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. What's the idea there? What's that meant to convey? You don't have to, there's no deep meaning here. What's the idea of God sending his angels to take care of you meant to convey? You don't have to walk alone. There's someone there. Yeah, yeah God's always there. He's always. You never walk alone. That would be a good song. Yeah, he, he will guard you in some of your ways. All of your ways. He will, concern, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all his ways. You have, you have a spiritual bodyguard. And this is only for, for those who are, who are the Lord's. This is not something that, that every single person can claim. So that's a, that's a big deal. That's a promise, and that's an idea that's conveyed in verse 11. Verse 12 says, On their hands they will bear you up. Still talking about the angels. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. What's the what's the meaning conveyed just in verse twelve there? No, Protection. Yeah, they're going to guard you, protect you, pick you up. That's the idea. And and look, look. If you're going through your entire day, and if you're going through your entire day and you stub your toe, is that considered a big part of your day or a little part of your day? Little part. Little part, right? It ruins your whole day. It does, but it's a little thing in the grand scheme of things, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the idea yeah. is also meant to convey. That God is concerned about you even in the little things, like the stubbing of your toe. 
It's meant to, again, it's, it's highlighting God's faithfulness and his provision and his protection and his being a stronghold and a refuge and a fortress for us, even when it talks about something that is the smallest thing in everyday life. He protected my pillow 11 times when I broke it. <laughs> <laughs> so isn't that, isn't that interesting? That's a, great, that's a great point that I like to really highlight is that this isn't just in the big scheme of a wild war and battle, but even in just the stubbing of your toe. That's, that's pretty important. Verse 13 says, You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Uh, what's that a metaphor for? Think of it very generally. Don't overthink it. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. We've been talking about God's protection, so what is this a, a metaphor enemies. for? Yeah, just deadly, deadly situations. Enemies, deadly situations from attacks, your enemies. It's all the same. You'll tread on the lion and the adder, you will overcome it. Uh, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot, you'll overcome it because of God's protection. Again, it's just, just a metaphor, again, for God's protection. Does everyone know what an adder is? Mm-hmm. What is it? Sorry, it's just an ad stuck together. It's a snake. An adder? It's a snake. <laughs> oh, Bob, you got to deal with that, that humor. An adder. That's, that's why I mow that. They're much more. Grass for four hours. <laughs> I'll tell you what, adders, adders are much more dangerous than subtractors, I'll tell you. <laughs> That's funny. Now, there's a second part to question seven, which asks, where are verses 11 and 12 quoted in the New Testament and by whom? How about the by whom? Who quotes that? Who, who, when we were reading that, who had their brain going tick, 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 kind of tickling? Didn't Satan say yes. that to, to, to who? Jesus to Jesus. when he was, was um, judging the, him? Yep, the yep. Yes, I remember. Yep. Good job. And the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke. You'll have that recorded. <laughs> where Satan will quote, his ver- yeah. Satan, now, now recognize this, Satan uses scripture. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. But he doesn't yeah. use it, he doesn't handle it rightly. But he uses scripture. He quotes Psalm 91. And so Jesus responds instead, right? He says, he quote, Jesus responds using scripture rightly. He responds using Deuteronomy 6, uh, verse 16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. That's what Jesus says. Oh, you don't want to trust the Lord or test the Lord. You want to trust the Lord. And so he gives the example of how the Israelites didn't trust the Lord, and looked, for, looked for signs and wanted God to do things for him instead of just trusting God to provide the way that God would provide. What are the verses? For which? That you're referring to. The Deuteronomy 6.16 6, is the Jesus' response. And uh, Matthew, I think both in Matthew and Luke, it's both chapter 4 for the temptation of Christ. In yeah, the I read when I was reading that, I was reading a little ahead of why you were talking, and I'm like, I know I've heard that before. I know I've heard that before. Mm-hmm. And I kept sitting here thinking and thinking and thinking, and I thought, I think Satan said that to Jesus when he was mm-hmm. touching me, but boy, well, I sound stupid if I say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were right. You were right. Oh, I well, think that's if, what I did. If I she was reading ahead, head, she wasn't listening. <laughs> she said I get one of those yeah, guys with one of your sayings oh okay well the hard part is going to be picking a saying because there's so many good ones oh, yeah. <laughs> see how much I've learned see we'll yeah. keep you in business for a while <laughs> <laughs> no pressure no pressure okay. question 8 what do verses 14 through 16 mean these are the last verses of the psalm because he holds fast to me in love uh, remember, that comes from the song that we like to sing, mm-hmm. He Will Hold Me Fast. Yeah. Uh, because he holds fast to me in love. Because who holds fast? God. God. Beca- well, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. Who is it that's speaking? Oh, 
So God's speaking, but God's speaking about the one who's holding fast to him in love. So get, yeah. Sometimes when we chop it up into verse by verse like this, we have to reset because we're in, the, in one mode of thinking. So we have to make sure that we're reading this right. God is speaking here. And God is saying, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him, right? And obviously, when we read that last part, we know it's talking that God is speaking. Because we don't deliver God. He delivers us. So, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. And with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's just go uh, verse by verse. Verse 14. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. So we know God is speaking there. What's he, what's he doing here? He's describing something. Salvation. He's describing... Intimate knowledge, he's holding fast to me in love. I will deliver him, I will protect him. These sound like blessings or promises, don't they? Yeah. So those who so, know him. That's right. And who don't just know him, but hold fast to him in love. So this is, a, this, is, this is a personal knowledge. Again, this would be like the difference between, oh yeah, I know Jesus, and Jesus is my everything. You can say you know God, you can say you know Christ, but it's a far different thing to say, I have an intimate relationship with God and with Christ. And so when it says, because he holds fast to me in love, this is speaking of an intimate relationship. This isn't just a superficial, sure, I know God. This is an intimate relationship. And those who have that intimate relationship, um, God has promised to deliver them, protect them, because they know his name. That's, again, intimate knowledge of him. And when he calls to me, verse 15, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. What, uh, what's that telling us there? He's faithful. It's faithful. He'll answer, right? He'll act. He's faithful. It's also a neat promise there that not only will God answer, not only will God be with us in trouble, but he'll also do what at the end of verse 15? Rescue. Rescue and honor. Honor. That's pretty cool. God will honor me? Not that I deserve any honor. But God will honor me? Wow. Really, when God honors me, he's really honoring himself. He's really glorifying himself, right? When he brings us to glorification and he completes the good work in us that he began, Philippians 1.6, we're, we're being glorified, but he gets the glory. And it's the same sense here. We're, we might be honored because he brings us to a place of honor, but he's the one who receives all the honor. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, like he receives all the honor. Because Christ covered us with his righteousness. Yes, that imputed righteousness is, is critical because that's what guarantees you your blessed assurance of heaven is his righteousness given or imputed to you and me. And it also is critical because that's how we're able to say, I know that I am right with God. Because not only did Jesus die for all my sins, but he also gave me his righteousness. And because he did that, and not me, and because he's perfect, he did it all perfectly, once and for all. Therefore, I have complete and total trust and faith in God and in what God has done, so I have no reason to doubt or fear because it's not about me, it's about him. And the only thing, and that's, that's, the, that's a really key point for when you're sharing gospel or when you're talking to other people who are either baby believers or who are maybe on the outskirts of Christianity, biblical Christianity, you know, that's a really important note because most people don't receive that right off the bat. When they go into most churches, you're not going to hear that truth. You're going to hear, you know, give your heart to Jesus. Uh, ask Jesus into your heart. Uh, pray this prayer. Uh, all these things that, that sound biblical, but are not found in the Bible. But what I told you before, those things that aren't in the Bible, it's perfectly biblical. And now, well, wait a minute, now you understand it. Wait a minute, a true biblical Christian, when they're talking about being saved and stuff, they're not getting up on a soapbox talking about how righteous and how good they are and all the good things they do. What they're really doing is falling on their knees and pointing to Christ that they're putting up on the highest of pedestals. 
and saying, I am only saved because of what he has done for the forgiveness of my sins. And I am only made righteous because it's not even my righteousness. He's giving me his to wear as if it's mine. That, and th now how much more impactful is that than, you know, let Jesus into your heart. Uh, Jesus loves you. You know, well, he who sins at all time has Jesus in your heart. Franklin Graham. Oh, yeah. All time. Well, so did Billy. Say, pray this prayer. Well, he started to say that. Didn't Billy start that? Yeah. yeah, I don't remember. There, so there, before, before Billy Graham, there was Billy Sunday, who was who kind of the, the original Billy Graham of sorts. And that you have quite a bit of that kind of talk. Now, verse 16 says, With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. What is, what is that referring to? Yeah, but it's also referring to just, yeah, I mean, basically, uh, it is referring to eternal life as far as, like, the messianic kingdom that's coming. And it's also referring to just, you know, uh, if you obey the word of the Lord, honor your father and mother so that you might live long in the land, right? So obedience to the Lord brings blessing, and long life was considered an example of blessing, and what would be an even more amazing blessing is eternal life, right? So this is referencing not just long life as a general Old Testament blessing, but also the fact that, look, there's a blessing upon blessing when it comes to eternal life and the Messianic kingdom and the kingdom to come. And then it says at the end, uh, let me get back to it, with long life I will satisfy him and I will show him my salvation. There's your link between long life and eternal life because he's talking about my salvation, which... What's that, what's that even tell you that God calls it his salvation? That he's the only one who can save you. Absolutely. And that he's responsible, that he's the one. It's his salvation. So therefore, he gives it to whom he wishes. And if he gives it to somebody, and it's what he wishes, do you think he's going to go back on his word? Mm -hmm. All right. So then that would, that would speak to eternal security. And it also speaks to the fact that it's him. He's the one right? He's responsible for it. He's the one who gives it. He's going to be the one who makes sure that you get from where you are now to glorification in heaven. Isn't that reassuring? So, you know, you're going to have to fear in that. So, that's it for Psalm 91.